But once in the air, uh, it could do things that no other aeroplane could do. And I think the point I make in the book, and it's an interesting comparison with Spitfire, is that I don't think that there's any other aeroplane in history that has managed to fulfill successfully uh, all four roles that uh, air power doctrine suggests an air force needs to carry out. Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bowman. In March 1945, the RAF's 140-wing of two group of the 2nd Tactical Air Force flew an audacious raid into the heart of Copenhagen. They flew at wave top level all the way across the North Sea and then down into Copenhagen itself, where they attacked the Shell House, which was the headquarters of the Gestapo. Now, 140-wing had form. They'd done this thing before. But this particular raid is one of interest for us today as we are joined by Roland White, who's the author of Mosquito, the RAF's legendary wooden wonder and its most extraordinary mission. And it really is an extraordinary story. Throughout the book, we look at what's going on in Denmark, along with the incredible men of 140 Wing, led by the mercurial Basil Embry, who we will talk about probably not as much as we should, but he's a massive rabbit hole. Roland very generously gave me some of his time. So if you're watching this on day of release, the book is out today, especially here in the UK. Links in the description below to grab it. Do all the likes and subscribes, all that good stuff. But we have to start with the elephant in the room, because if I go over here to the bookshelf and I grab his last book, which is Harrier 809, right at the back, there's a teaser in it. For what should have been the next book so we have to start by asking roland why didn't we get the tornado book let's get starting because the, the, the opening question is the one i asked you when we were at paul's thing because mm. i have of course yeah Harrier eight or nine which is fantastic and at the end of it you have a fantastic tease for six uh, 617 squadron in the gulf that didn't happen so no. What was the story behind that? I think I know the answer. It's the C yeah, well, word. It, but it, it, why did yeah, why didn't we get the six one seven book? Uh, it was a book I was really excited about writing. I, I talked to my publisher uh, about writing a trilogy of books that took us from, uh, I suppose, the late late seventies through to um, around two thousand. And the idea was that uh, Harrier eight oh nine would be the first, and would start with Simon Hargreaves intercepting the first uh, Argentinian aircraft that that, that encountered the, the task force. Uh, Nineteen eighty two uh, uh, would uh, skip through um, tornado. Um, in the mid 80s, seen a lit largely through the prism of 617 Squadron's uh, involvement in the 1984 Giant Voice Strategic Air Command bombing competition, which uh, th they were not expected to do well in, at least by the Pentagon, but ended up winning. And in doing so, established some of the uh, expertise in medium level bombing that would then be required um, in Gulf War One uh, when a uh, Precision bombing capability was introduced, interestingly, by um, uh, Bob Iverson uh, as boss of 617 Squadron, who had been shot down flying a Harrier in the Falklands. And then the, the, the trilogy was going to finish with a book that looked at Britain's relationship with stealth, um, ending with the selection of the X-35 over the X-32 in the um, famous Joint Strike Fighter X-Plane competition through the prism of the RAF pilots who flew the F-117 stealth fighter on exchange, but ending with a, an epilogue uh, that featured Simon Hargreaves, who you'll remember was going to feature in the prologue of the first book, or did feature in the prologue of the first book, flying the first uh, X mission in which uh, he took off normally, uh, or a short takeoff, uh, refueling supersonic flight, and then landed vertically in the same sortie, thus proving the capability of the the um, X-35. And I'd got about two-thirds of the way through all the interviews for the second book, the 617 Squadron book, um, and then COVID hit. And suddenly all of those uh, road trips that I was plan planning over the summer to go and do the last few interviews with the people uh, involved in that that. 1984 bombing competition kind of went up in smoke and 
you know, all of us were uh, wondering, uh, you know, how we would fill the time that uh, we we had been given through no, no longer con- commuting, um, uh, how we were going to reorganize our lives as a result of uh, the restrictions that were imposed on us. And, and I thought, well, I, I need to try and find a subject to replace the 617 squadron book, which I can't pursue in the way that I'd wanted to, um, with something I can. And it struck me that doing a Second World War story uh, where I would be relying on um, archives and uh, um, previously written accounts, given that all of the participants were, were already deceased, um, was the way forward. And I'd always loved the uh, um, Mosquito, and I'd always been aware of those uh, 140 wing raids, um, uh, Amiens Prison, um, or Hoos in, uh, in Jutland, and then obviously perhaps the most uh, substantial one of them, the raid on the Gestapo H- HQ in, in Copenhagen, and um, thought, right, uh, let's take a, a dive into Second World War, which I'd never done before. I'd always sort of almost deliberately stayed clear of it because I felt there were people like James Holland and Ben McIntyre and, and, and John Nicholl doing it really, really well, um, whereas I'd sort of found my own Cold War niche. So that's that's how it came about. Yeah, still want that tornado book. It sounded really yeah, good. yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I do too. I, I do too. It's, it's uh, trying to establish lost momentum is tough. But the, that tornado book, and uh, just to tempt you further, because I mean, I really am interested in it. The it in in that story, you also have the Australian F one elevens who competed in the same competition. You've also got F one elevens from Lakenheath um, in Norfolk, uh, Suffolk rather, um, competing um, in the same competition. Um, and you know, inter- I mean, I spoke to some of the Australian crews involved. The um, one of the navigators um, uh, had been uh, uh, was the navigator aboard the Canberra that dropped the last Australian bomb um, in Vietnam. So you've got all sorts of threads that that can come into that story. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it's got a lot going for it. With, you know, without a doubt. <laughs> <laughs> and you know that. Uh, so anyway, I've got to I've got to make a decision about what's next. And that it's in the frame, but um, I may have caught the Second World War bug as well. It, it it bites hard that one, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, let let's get into it really because I thoroughly enjoyed it, and thank you so much for sending over a copy nice and early because I I devoured it. It was I have to admit didn't devour it as quickly as Harrier Eight Hundred Nine. I I think that's because it's. Um, uh, uh, about forty percent longer. <laughs> Harry, <laughs> Harry and I, I think um, Harry Harry eight oh nine is in lots of ways a more uh, obviously. I mean, this is the beauty of the Falklands War. It, it was six weeks long. Mm-hmm. You know, a- any story about the Falklands War uh, is, you know, it's by definition self-contained, and you can feed different threads into it. Whereas, um, you know, the story in um, uh, in, in Copenhagen in, in Mosquito. Uh, depends on you understanding the things that came first. And unless you have a, unless you have become engaged with, uh, involved with and invested in the things that led to that raid, and that is the career of the Mosquito, um, the, the people who led uh, the, the, the wing that um, carried out the raid, but also uh, of the lives and the efforts of the people on the ground in Denmark who um, begged for it, um, it doesn't carry the, the the sort of substance and resonance that uh, you know any good story needs. You need to care about um, everybody involved, and for that you have to go back two years. So I'm not talking about six weeks. I'm talking about two years. And uh, so really, the beginning of 1943 is where where the story begins. The thing that I really enjoyed about Mosquito is actually less the mosquito bits it was that whole the whole section the research you did into the danish resistance because denmark has in the sort of popular readings of things you know we we hear about what's going on in holland and and um uh, france mainly because of you know market garden and overlord but denmark was that sort of strange place because the the when the nazis invaded annex in april 1940 they called it a model protectorate because they were trying to do something different with Denmark. What what was that? Because that really creates a lot of tension within the various groups within Denmark. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, D- D- Hitler, uh, the Nazis really uh, had no designs on Denmark at all. 
they were probably you know happy enough for, for would have been happy enough for it to remain neutral except that in order to seize Norway which was a country that they uh, really did want to to take control of uh, because of um, you know iron ore supplies and the rest of it um, they needed Denmark as a stepping stone so Denmark was really just a casualty of geography uh, it was on the way to to Norway um, Denmark uh, um, had no uh, the, the armed forces were you know, utterly incapable of uh, resisting any kind of um, Nazi attack and unlike Norway there wasn't the space or the geography to uh, to, to, to get the government and the and the king uh, uh, away from the country um, before the Germans were there. They came into Copenhagen, they came up north uh, through uh, Schleswig-Holstein at exactly the same time. And the decision was taken that uh, in order to save lives, um, uh, they they had to go along with the German demand that they that they would uh, remain, you know, independent under German control and Germany would protect their neutrality. So uh, they remained uh, for the for for certainly um, three years. uh, Denmark was in this sort of weird superposition between occupation and independence, neutrality and, and, and being part of the axis in which they had an elected government and the king remained uh, in Copenhagen. And so uh, they were, from a legal point of view, um, an Axis power. Um, so unlike, you mentioned the Netherlands and France and others, unlike the Netherlands, Belgium, France, uh, Poland, there was no possibility of, uh, of um, free Danes simply joining and setting up uh, units of their own under the the, the Allied command. You know, Denmark had the, it had a unique position, and and the Germans hoped that through uh, a light touch they would be able to sort of demonstrate the world that to the world that actually you know being uh, under the protectorate of the Reich was uh, not necessarily the worst thing in the world. So they had an interest in Denmark being happy, stable, well fed, comfortable, and all, all the rest of it. You start introducing the most fabulous cast of characters in in Denmark. We're we're going to get to the RF guys, and I'm purposely putting Basil Emery as far back yeah. as we could because that's a rabbit hole we can disappear yeah. down for a while. But the the thing that I found really interesting is is you've got the tensions within Denmark from those who were trying not to cause trouble and those who wanted to resist you have that tension. Then in London as well, you've got a bit of a turf war between MI6 and SOE as well mm. over Denmark. For you writing it, and you, you you explain it beautifully, how do you sort of unpick all those tensions so that you can you can, you can can make it make sense? Because I, yeah. I can see when you were probably reading the files, you were just sort of pulling your hair out at times. I mean, it was, um, it was the thing I think which concerned me most i mean there is more undoubtedly there's more uh that happens on the ground in this story than in 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 the other books and i in the end was uh, th- there was a gift in the uh, for me in the shape of um a gathering of two families um in denmark in the summer of 1939 um that seemed to me to op- offer uh, a through line um which uh, at the same time as introducing them at the beginning, um, carried me through to the end, through which I could explore all sorts of other directions and keep connecting it to the centre. Um, and I, you know, it it was one of those sort of eureka moments. And occasionally, as you're doing your your research, you you come across them. And so it was two families, the Lassens and the Witchfelds, got together in the summer of uh, of 1939 before. Uh, war had broken out, but undoubtedly, you know, storm crowd, clouds were um, forming over Europe. They were an Anglo, uh, or, or the um, the Lassens were a Danish um, German family, and the Witchfelds were um, an Anglo Danish family. Um, and um, on the the Witchfeld side, uh, Monica, um, this the sort of matriarch, uh, was a an Irish aristocrat who, in search, you know, thought Ireland was boring uh, as a teenager growing up, despite having helped uh, work as a gun runner for her father. Uh, it was sort of, you know, the, the rural life in Ireland was too small for her. Um, married a, a 
a Danish aristocrat who lived, who worked at the embassy um, uh, and moved to Denmark, where she became the sort of uh, the head of his estate there. Her great friend was Suzanne Lassen, um, and she was a children's book illustrator. Um, their kids are interesting too. Monica Witchfeld had three, um, uh, daughter Inky and two boys. Uh, uh, Suzanne Lassen um, had a couple of boys and uh, also there that summer was their cousin. Um, so uh, uh, Inky Witchfeld uh, went on, she was 19 years old, she went on to marry the head of the SOE um, in, uh, in Denmark um, after becoming his secretary. Monica ran the resistance on an island called Lolland and went on to become the first Danish woman sentenced to death by the Nazis um, and a a sort of rallying point for the resistance as a result. Um, Anders Lassen, Suzanne's oldest son, became the only member of the SAS during the Second World War to win the VC. And he's an extraordinary character. His story alone is a podcast. Uh, Anders' brother, Franz, uh, uh, also managed to escape from Denmark uh, and he joined uh, SOE as an agent and was parachuted back into um, to Copenhagen as an explosives instructor. Um, and then their cousin, Axel van den Busch, um, was a member of an elite Prussian unit who uh, disgusted, appalled by uh, witnessing the, uh, the, the killing of Jews by the SS in Ukraine. Um, realized he could no longer serve the regime that uh, he, 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 was, um, he should have been loyal to um, and made his way to the German resistance and to Klaus von Stauffenberg. Um, and he became the first person uh, uh, tasked with uh, assassinating Hitler. And um, when we can talk about that later, obviously it, it, it didn't happen, but it was... It was a whisker. It was a well-planned, very, very elegantly thought out um, operation, which uh, faltered right at, I mean, within days of taking place uh, at at the hand of mosquitoes, um, uh, ironically enough. But through those, um, through Monica and her daughter Suzanne and her sons, uh, I was able to, to, to find a way of linking a lot of that stuff that happened on the ground in Denmark in a way that, that, that felt as if it was a, a, a really compelling story that, that belonged together. I think he succeeded. I... Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. It was fun. I mean, it was a lot of, <laughs> lot of fun. I mean, you can imagine as a you know, writer, you kind of get that. You think, this is just gold. What, you know, this is just fantastic. Because it, they, you know, we we won't we won't spoil it too much, dear listener. But yeah, Fleming's most the um, Ralph Hollingsworth as well running running the show oh. back in London as well. They, they're just wonderful characters, and you know you get into things about expenses and stuff, which normally would be a bit dry. But you just think they're yeah they could they expenses. Could be... God, this, this, we don't want to sell this book on the strength of expenses, Matt. Uh, no, I but yeah, you, you think... had mentioned that. No, but it, I I thought it was great. You know, here 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 we are. We're all probably about to get shot tomorrow. So yeah, yeah. let's let's use the yeah, kitty I mean, to yeah, the, yeah, to yeah, the yeah, best. Yeah. Well, I, you're, you're you're talking about um, Fleming Moose, Please. who uh, in, as I mentioned, Inky mm. Inky Witchfeld Wetch, married, and and Fleming Moose uh, was uh, I mean he was he was quite a character. He was exiled to West Africa uh, for, for he was part of a you know very wealthy family in Denmark, exiled to West Africa for forging a. Uh, a check uh, on the company account, um, and then he became an, a sort of um, got a, a, a sort of Kurt type character in West Africa, where he essentially had um, you know, in, ter- in complete autonomy uh, over a region, uh, trading region. Uh, but when war broke out, um, as many of the expats did, he kind of felt more strongly about uh, the the idea that that. That Germany shouldn't the idea of Germany's occupation of Denmark should not stand than many of the people who were in Denmark, and he made his way by dugout canoe, by torpedoed freighter, um, and ultimately uh, British destroyer all the way back to Liverpool, um, where he uh, joined SOE, was trained as a parachute agent, 
um, and then parachuted back into um, into Denmark uh, to take control of SOE in in, in January nine in January nineteen forty three and and up and then up until then between nineteen forty and nineteen forty three the uh, special operations executive effort in Denmark. Um, led by Ralph Hollingworth, who was a Royal Navy Reserve officer who uh, had been in Denmark on the day of the invasion. Had, had, it had it'd been bedeviled by bad luck, um, but with Moose, it suddenly kind of caught a wave. He was incre- for, for all uh, his flaws, he was incredibly energetic. He was a doer. Um, and he made all the sort of necessary connections to um, accelerate the work of SOE in Denmark and, and really make sure that, that those who were inclined to uh, fight the Germans uh, had the equipment and the organisation and the support from Britain that they needed to do that. It, it's a fantastic cast of individualists, isn't it, who, who sort of band uh, together? Because, because when we start looking at the other side, as we said, we're going to get on to Basil and Brie as well, but... We've got the Mosquito itself, which is yeah. the most amazing individualist aircraft you could you could think of. And, and despite my love for a certain Hawker aircraft, which I'm sure we'll get <laughs> mentioned in a minute, I, I think, and I said this on the, the old History Rage thing, I think it's the Mosquito that should get the adoration the Spitfire mm. does because yeah, yeah. People, people think the Spitfire did everything. The Mosquito literally did. I, yeah. I, I, I guess because it's this sort of, central character as much as the people that fly them and and uh, the Danes as well to you what makes the mozzie so special I mean it's a sort of well-worn cliche isn't it that if it looks right it flies right um and uh you know you can think of lots of examples of where that's not the case but if, if there were an example of an airplane that absolutely uh, uh embodies that notion it's it's the mosquito i mean when jeffrey de havilland uh the uh the 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 uh, man behind the de havilland um uh, aircraft company uh, first saw it he said it seems to be made mostly of engines and propellers and it does have that sort of incredibly sort of aggressive powerful uh front-footed feel to it even on the ground it's all kind of uh power and potential and in in the air it um it, it, that was no less true. Uh, you know, when, when it was first demonstrated to Hap Arnold, the uh, US Army general who ran the Army Air Corps um, in spring of 1941, he saw, he saw a number of planes that year. Um, but that was the, the Mosquito was the airplane that he uh, reckoned was outstanding and insisted on taking a full set of plans back with him. But it's because Jeffrey de Havilland's son, uh, also confusingly called Jeffrey, uh, had performed a display for him, which ended in a sort of spiraling vertical climb above the airfield, um, which I'm sure was impressive enough. Uh, and uh, and then repeated the whole display with one engine feathered. Um, so if the first time uh, didn't impress you, the second time really was going to impress you. Um, but, uh, you know, every pilot who flew the Mosquito had sort of similarly... Uh, uh, um, similar fondness for it. it it absolutely tugged to the left on um, on takeoff because it had two propellers that were powerfully spinning in the same direction um, but once in the air uh, it could do things that no other airplane could do and I think the point I make in the book and it's an interesting comparison with Spitfire is that I don't think that there's any other airplane in history that has managed to fulfill successfully uh, all four roles that uh, air power doctrine suggests an air force needs to carry out. So obviously fighter air defense is mm-hmm. kind of straightforward enough. So, uh, so the Mosquito was uh, the most effective night fighter of the Second World War and, and um, uh, racked up a huge tally of kills uh, in that capacity. It was designed as a fast bomber and it excelled in that. Uh, that role could carry um, to Berlin a bomb load um, that was as substantial as the early models of the um, the B-17 Flying Fortress. But it did it with a crew of two instead of ten, and it could do it twice in a night because it was so fast uh, rather than once. Um, the third role uh, is um, intelligence, reconnaissance, surveillance, uh, and, and the Mosquito was the preeminent 
um, reconnaissance airplane, Second World War, uh, responsible for crisscrossing Europe and bringing back vitally important photographs like those that told us where the Germans were uh, developing the V1 and V2 missiles. And then lastly, this is perhaps most surprisingly of all, um, uh, is mobility and air transport. And here, the Mosquito was sort of pressed into service for British aircraft, British Overseas uh, Airways Corporation, um, the precursor to British Airways, to fly the ball bearing route, what was known as the ball bearing route between RAF Lucas and Stockholm in Sweden. Stockholm supplied the best ball bearings in the world. They were required for well, every single aero engine that we made. So every Merlin that went into a Lancaster, Spitfire, Hurricane, uh, Mosquito, Halifax, you know, the rest of it uh, uh, required ball bearings. Um, so the, the, you had to run the gauntlet of the German air defences in northern Denmark and southern Norway between Scotland and, and, and Stockholm to do that. Um, the DC-3s were hopelessly vulnerable as a, a couple that were shot down by the, a couple of Swedish um, uh, uh, DC-3s that were shot down by the Germans demonstrated. Um, but um, the Mosquito had a chance of getting through. And so 12 Mosquitos uh, that, were on, that were on the civil register for BOAC, flown by civilian crews, uh, flew to and from Denmark. But as well as ball bearings and diplomatic baggage, they also carried passengers. Um, they could carry in a felt line Bombay uh, with a oxygen mask, um, sandwich and a flask of coffee, a uh, single passenger. And a remarkable number of people, uh, they, they brought back um, uh, pilots and uh, navigators, and air crew had been shot down and occupied Europe and made their way to Sweden. Uh, but they also brought, brought back, most notably, perhaps, Neil Spohr, who was the, after Einstein, perhaps the most second famous scientist um, in the world, a nuclear physicist, eventually persuaded when the Germans moved against the Jewish population in Denmark to leave. Um, he was flown back from Sweden to Scotland in the belly of a mosquito in a flight, which, because he had such a large head, nearly killed him. Um, he genuinely uh, couldn't get the, the um, oxygen mask to fit. Uh, and so he, he lost consciousness um, at altitude and sort of dropped out of the Bombay when they arrived in Scotland. And the crew, who'd been concerned about his silence throughout the flight, uh, thought they might have killed him. But happily, he was revived and uh, none the worse for his experience. But you know, there were many, many. I mean, they also used to carry people to, to Sweden to carry out um, cultural visits um, for the British Council, like, you know, composer and conductor Malcolm Sargent was flown out to Stockholm to, to, to do music. Uh, and, it, and sadly, it wasn't in a, in a Mosquito, it was actually in uh, one of the other airplanes, which prior to the Mosquito, BOAC used. Um, T.S. Eliot was flown to, uh, to Stockholm for the same reason, to conduct some cultural tour of, the ambassador wasn't sure uh, what kind of books to leave in um, in T.S. Eliot's room until he discovered that he was a great lover of crime fiction, so he just put crime books in there. And But Eliot came back to the embassy after a poetry reading, covered in lipstick kisses, because he'd been sort of mobbed by Swedish fans. Uh, I just, I, I mean, sadly, he didn't go in the belly of a mosquito, but... Um, uh, <laughs> that, that whole ferry route is just... The most, yeah. In in you look at it now, you think that that's nuts. And, you know, I guess if you, yeah. you you've never heard of Niels Bohr, but you went to see Oppenheimer, that's the Kenneth. Yeah, Banner. so yeah, that's yeah. right. So so, he mentions the yeah. British put in the Bombay because you know in talking about uh, the, the the four roles, I I only mentioned that this thing was made out of wood, and and that was the thing that uh, annoyed Goering, the head of the Luftwaffe, kind of almost more than anything. He'd, so, he said. When, when his big day on the, he was supposed to be making a speech on the 10th anniversary of the Nazis' accession to power, when his big day was ruined by a very, very well-timed uh, Mosquito bombing run, 11 a.m. over Berlin. Um, he sort of ranted that he was green and yellow with envy about these machines that the British, who could afford aluminium better than the Germans, uh, could make in any piano factory all around the country. Um, and I mean, on another occasion, said to them, you know, look, 
forget all your efforts. So this was to the head of his, um, you know, the technical heads of all the German aircraft com companies. Forget it. Let's just make the, this, this amazingly primitive aircraft, he said, you know, dripping with sarcasm. Um, let's just make, like, let's make mosquitoes. Um, we'd be better off just making mosquitoes. Um, and, uh, you know, really, really wound him up because the Berliners would say, you know, well, uh, and this is quoted, this is from Adolf Gallen's book, uh, the, the fighter race charged with trying to protect Germany. He said, um, you know, the Berliners would say, you know, what is it? You know, the fat one can't even protect us from a few little mosquitoes. Um, and they, you know, they, they never came up with the Jet 262, a uh, machine that could reliably um, intercept the mosquitoes. Yeah. See Colin Bell for, for more on that. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the Pima Air and Space Museum with Head of Collections, Andrew Bowley. Here we're at the Pima Air and Space Museum with our Douglas A-20G Havoc. Um, the A-20 Havoc was an attack aircraft light bomber of World War II. Um, originally built and designed with a glass nose with a bombardier. Um, in the Pacific Theater, like B-25s, Pappy Gunn came up with this idea of manning these aircraft with solid noses and a bunch of machine guns for doing strafing attacks on Japanese airfields and attacking Japanese shipping. Um, this aircraft is an actual combat veteran. It flew with the 89th Bomb Squadron in New Guinea uh, on a mission, uh, I think bombing WeWAC. It was damaged and made an emergency landing in a swamp in New Guinea. The crew was recovered and the aircraft sat there pretty much forever until it was found in the 80s and in the early 90s it was recovered by the Royal Australian Air Force. This A-20 with another one that they had, um, they restored the one Helen Pelican which was another combat veteran from the Pacific. Um, they used a lot of the parts from this aircraft for that aircraft. Then actually went to a civilian owner and then we ended up buying from that civilian owner and finished up the restoration put it on display here. Uh, it's a unique. It's a unique aircraft in the fact there's only about four, if I recall, A-20 Havocs anywhere on display in the world, um, with one in a private collection, one at the Air Force Museum, one here, and one in a private collection in Russia. But uh, I'd say it's always been one of my favorite aircraft. I think just because of the, you know, lack of them as survivors, and also just seeing a lot of those cool photos from World War II where you see these A-20s coming in low over a ball bombing Japanese cruisers and, and transports and you know they're like literally flying right like at mass height over these ships um, so I just always found it to be a pretty cool airplane. To learn more about what is on display and what events are coming up at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, please do check out their website at www.pimaair.org. And now, back to the show. Let's 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 talk about those those mosquito raids because I think my there's always someone in your books that I just fall in love with mm -hmm. and in this one it was it was Ted Sismore the yeah. navigator because that poor lad had some stress mm -hmm. you know the, the the low level raids that they're having to fly and he's having to do by dead reckoning at yeah know, 300 miles an hour at weight literal wave top levels and he's what 22 I think he, yeah I mean he's he's, he's <laughs> yeah he's I mean, it's absolutely extraordinary. I mean, I've, I've got a son who's the same age as Ted Sismal. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to be rude about him now. but I mean, <laughs> And in fact, it, it, he has just today uh, been given a place on a university air squadron, which is uh, oh, very exciting. Yeah. But there's a big difference between um, being given a place on a university air squadron um, and being responsible for delivering 18 mosquitoes uh, on over three hours uh, from Norfolk to downtown Copenhagen um, to, to hit a single building. And um, the pressure that this young man, Ted Sismore, was under, and like, like you, Matt, I, 
he was almost the, before even Basil Embry, Ted Sizemore, this young navigator was my, my way into the, into it because it seemed so unlikely somehow that such a young man uh, could uh, make such an impression on such a senior officer so quickly and be given such extraordinary levels of responsibility. Um, and he was the person I first wanted to try to get to know a little more. And I managed through an auction house who'd sold um, his medals uh, to make contact with his son, who was... Uh, you know, only too happy to help. Uh, and I, you know, I was absolutely, I mean, this, uh, every so often you kind of come across a, there's something makes your day, um, and puts a huge smile on your face. When I got in touch with Martin Sismore, his son, he knew me, uh, much to my surprise, uh, because actually both he and Ted, uh, before he died in 2012, um, had read Falcon 607. So I mean, the thought that Ted Sismore, this, um, the, who, who went on to become uh, by just 23 at the end of the war, 1945, he's just 23 years old, the most decorated navigator of the entire war, um, had um, read uh, Vulcan 607. And what one of the things which uh, surprised me and, you know, perhaps kind of bound me to his story even more tightly was the discovery that... Um, after leaving the Air Force, he had a very successful um, career in the Air Force after the Second World War. Uh, he worked for Marconi and had, during the Falklands War, been the sort of um, go-between responsible uh, for ensuring that the RAF could get a mobile radar uh, that was in storage, a Marconi mobile radar that was in, in storage from, uh, from the UK to Chile to give early warning of raids against the um, the, the British fleet um, from Argentina. So um, there, there's a lovely sort of um, symmetry about that for me. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm obviously very sad I didn't get to talk to Ted Sismore myself, but I managed to find quite a lot of interview footage with him um, and uh, and also talk to Martin, his son, about some of the things that, that I hadn't had a chance to read about elsewhere. I mean, a, a really remarkable man, very sort of mild-mannered, but there was always this sort of real quiet confidence uh, to him, which clearly Basil Embry, uh, who's a sort of legendary RAF figure, identified, recognised, and, and put absolute trust in. I mean, Embry was, you know, in his late, no, in his mid forties by now, um, but he was putting the uh, uh, responsibility for the success of these extremely difficult, challenging raids in which there were so many moving parts, so many opportunities to get it wrong, uh, in the hands of a navigator who's just twenty three years old. And Embry's one of those guys who talent spots so well, doesn't he? Because he he's he's in charge of two group, which in and of itself. We could be here for hours. Yeah. Um, but he's just this remarkable, almost anti-authority sort of figure, isn't yeah. he? And I have a question from one of my Patreon people, which feeds mm -hmm. into who Basil Embry is fantastic. We call them damn Castiers. Well, I do. I don't think yeah. they like it, but <laughs> it's... um. Uh, where are we? I've, I've gone and put it up here. Here we go. Um, Errol Cavett was asking, is there any, any indication that a ride along from with senior officers happened? I guess with Basil, we need to talk about Wing Commander Smith, don't we? Yeah, we do. I mean, you know, uh, Embry uh, was too senior. I mean, well, it wasn't simply that he was too senior. Uh, Embry had been in the Air Force uh throughout the 30s. He, in, interestingly, Bomber Harris had been uh, his squadron commander when they were um, stationed in Iraq, and he'd been to Afghanistan. He'd won the DFC before the Second World War even broke out, uh, Embry. And he was a squadron commander. He was a boss of a Blenheim squadron during the Battle of France. Um, and on the day that he was supposed to hand over command to uh, to his successor, he realised that he could slip in one mar one last raid uh, just before the deadline, which he did, and got shot down. And of course, you know, Embry being Embry, uh, he was picked up uh, not by just anyone, but um, by uh, the sort of most senior German tank commander that that was there in um, in France. Um, and uh, so he wore the sort of, you know, 
Nazi general's great coat in the car was he was interrogated by, by, by about the flak. He said, well, yeah, I think your flak is very good. It shot me down after all. But that was the beginning of a sort of two-month odyssey uh, where he escaped from the Germans and was uh, evading them um, in France. For two, he was captured again, but he killed his guards, uh, hid in a dung, in a dung heap for three hours, um, before uh, getting away after they'd come and gone. Um, got to Paris, uh, tried to pretend he was American to see if the Americans could get him out, uh, managed to blag a bicycle from the Salvation Army, but eventually he got it back over the border and near Perpignan to Spain in the boot of a car driven by somebody from the uh, British Embassy, Embassy in Spain. So he, by the time he was back in the UK and wanting to you know, fight again, he was always wanting to fight, um, he had a price on his head because the Germans said he'd murdered his guards. Uh, I'm not sure he'd have seen it the same way. Um, so he was, he, he was um, a valuable commodity to the Germans, uh, was, as he became ever more senior, uh, somebody who should not have been flying uh, submissions um, over over occupied Europe, um, but he adopted an identity as of Wing Commander Smith. He got um, dog tags. Uh, he had uh, the name tapes put in his um, in his flights flight gear, and got rid of all of his badges of rank and replaced them with um, with Wing Commander Smiths, uh, and then flew on kind of all of the most um, eye-catching and significant raids that two group and 140 wing particularly flew for the rest of the war. He took over in, um, in summer of 1943. Um, and, uh, but, you know, as they began to prepare for, for, for uh, D-Day. Um, but uh, the only raid he didn't fly on um, was the Amiens prison raid. Uh, and that was because he was specifically told uh, he could not by Traffordly Mallory, uh, who then insisted that they have a meeting at, at, um, at Fighter Command uh, so that uh, he could make sure Embry was not disobeying that order. And that, that also meant poor Ted Sismal um, couldn't go either because Embry told him that if you can't go, um, if I can't go, you definitely can't go either. Um, so it meant uh, Percy Pickard, who was um, perhaps after Guy Gibson, uh, the most famous bomber pilot in the Air Force, uh, then led the raid, despite being quite inexperienced in flying um, mosquitoes at low level and, and uh, lost his life with his navigator on, on, on that raid. The Amiens raid is just yeah. remarkable. You know, fly, flying in snow at low mm -hmm. level you know, with yeah. mi minimal minimal fighter cover because most of the typhoons had turned back and you've got one seven that's right four and two four three i think were the ones that stuck with them um, yeah and, and and of course the, the one sector they don't cover is the one where picard runs into an fw 190 and, that's right yeah, terrible God, you think the amiel raids amazing you should hear about the copenhagen raid and there's a book all about it which is <laughs> <laughs> but this this is what i liked about it was you 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 cover amion you cover our house you know uh, yeah jean de saint longchamp makes gets a mention yeah. in there because it's a gestapo shot you don't I, I did call this one out in our notes you don't <laughs> you don't give old 146 wing and, and there are multiple attacks in amsterdam or rotterdam under johnny wells in, in no. typhoons but there's that I, I i don't one one thing Sorry. i no, it's, well, it's it's another book. There's, there's but it's a good opportunity for you mention. You meant it, you, we might have skipped over it if I hadn't left it out, mm. and it's given you an opportunity to mention it now. <laughs> there, there's, I, I, there's, there's so much. I, 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 my notes go on and on, and we've been chatting mm. for ages now. But there's, there's a bit in it where I think it, it's come up today um, or this week on military history Twitter that that terrible thing, which is napalm in Europe. Yeah, and, and that is something that has always been not really discussed. You know, uh, Lee Miller famously had mm. a lot of her footage yeah. from Saint Malo taken. The typhoons used it in um, uh, uh, against positions in in uh, Arnhem just before plunder varsity. But Embry's men use it to devastating effect in in Normandy, don't they? In in the summer of forty. Well, I, actually, it's a it's a little further south than that. Um, it's um, it's an SS barracks. Um, I'm going to forget the um, 
it says uh, Bonne uh, Matur, and I'm going to forget the name of the nearest town to that, but it's a, a little further south than, than Normandy, um, and it's where uh, there was uh, prior to and after um, D-Day um, an SAS unit operating, uh, an operation called Operation Bull Basket, and their job was uh, in harness with the resistance uh, to try to do everything that they could to uh, obstruct and delay and uh, make more difficult the Germans' reinforcement of Normandy. And uh, they were very uh, successful in doing that. The SAS with the resistance Mm. actually made sure that the SS didn't get to Normandy uh, at a time when they might have done some uh, damage and uh, but they were subsequently ambushed in a forest uh, this SS unit and they were uh, killed pretty unpleasant those who who didn't get away were killed pretty nastily and uh, when word got back uh, it was requested of uh, two group that they uh, uh, exact vengeance for that and uh, Basil Embry was only too happy to do that uh, and it they were using, for the first time, for the British at any rate, uh, napalm, which had been developed in the in the states, uh, and uh, you know it's nasty stuff. It's designed to burn at great temperature, but also to sort of glom onto whatever it's uh, stuck to. And you know the uh, Embry sort of parting statement in the briefing prior to the mission, um, when he'd explained who their target was and what they had done to these uh, SAS men that they'd captured and who should have been, were it not for the Hitler's commando order, uh, treated as prisoners of war and with all of the protections that that affords. Um, he explained all of that and said to his crews, you know, you, you, you let the bastards burn. And that is, that's exactly what what happened uh the mosquitoes went in took out a line of barracks on uh next to a river um and uh, there wasn't much left of either them or uh the ss who had been in there tucking into lamb stew uh made with uh, animals that they had poached from local farmers yeah it it was a perfect target it was yeah wood barracks in a wood which is exactly Mm -hmm. what napalm was designed to go after yeah it, uh, yeah 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 i yeah. mean the, embry yielded to to no one in his hatred of the enemy i mean that that what he had seen in france at the beginning of the war um there you know he he'd, he'd seen them uh running over refugees in tanks uh, uh he uh um he was very kind of affected by that and um driven by it and a determination to uh to to uh, to not rest actually until the germans were beaten and he saw other people who uh he identified that 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 trait in too because they're gonna have to be pushing home against targets yeah. that most most people would 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 balk at yeah. on, on that thought of pushing pushing on another one of my patreon listeners who's we probably all know it's joe wilding friend of the show yeah. who's been on he was asking when you were reading it and you do point this out in the book um what you sort of found when a fully loaded mosquito was going into a target like mm-hmm. copenhagen versus after it had dropped its its payload what sort of speed maneuverability would they notice for mm-hmm. and you, you do describe that quite well especially on the the exit on, on copenhagen which dear listener you'll notice i'm talking around because you got to read the book to, to find out <laughs> what happens on operation carthage but just on that sort of technical thing was she a sort of leaden duck before she dropped her load or was it only afterwards she became the swan that's a great sentence mm-hmm. um was she a leaden duck before she dropped her load um, no, um, I mean, uh, you know, the mosquito was blessed with an abundance of power. Um, and so, you know, takeoffs could be hairy, uh, particularly when they were heavily loaded. Um, and they always had that, that if you were going to get sort of bitten by a mosquito, it was going to be on takeoff much more so than, than, than landing even where you've not got power going through the engines. But, but no, once you're in the air. Uh, they were not, uh, with, because of that abundance of power, 
um, uh, you know, overly um, burdened by a two thousand pound bomb load. The, 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 the FB sixes that were flown in um, on uh, by by two group. They carried two five hundred pound bombs in the bomb bay, uh, and this is unlike the bomber models, which carried four, because the breaches from the twenty millimeter cannons in the nose uh, filled up half of the bomb bay. So they had two uh, bombs uh, in the Bombay, two 500-pound bombs under the wings. And, you know, obviously they're going to be a little bit more nimble um, than, uh, than they would have been without a 2,000-pound bomb load. Um, but um, really the only drag you're creating is, uh, is, is minimal um, and under the wings because they, they, they kept two of them in the, in the Bombay. Um, I, I didn't... Uh, encounter a single reference uh, in the research I was doing to uh, mosquitoes being um, uh, 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 kind of heavy, sluggish, difficult to control, uh, um, unmaneuverable, uh, or you know, anything else um, uh, suggesting that they were um, kind of anything less than they they might have been when they were carrying carrying bombs. I mean, you know, you you only sort of hear praise for uh, for their performance. Dear listener, we've run out of time to talk about the shell house and, and things like that. So there's a fantastic <laughs> book that is out today when you're listening to this, which will tell you all about it and the incredible people. Um, who were unfortunate enough to find themselves in it on that March morning. I have to ask you to wrap up, Roland. Mm -hmm. All of your books are very human. You, you tend to, to find that sort of that human yeah. thread, as we talked about to come before. This one, with the story of the Danish resistance and mm -hmm. the way, not doing a spoiler here, because it's the reason there's a raid, they get rolled up quite aggressively yeah. towards the end of 44, early 45. Mm -hmm. That seemed to me to be quite a different angle to the sort of the humans, the, the humans, the people that you've written about yeah. in the past. How did that affect you as you were writing it? Um, quite substantially. Uh, I, yeah, it, 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 you're right to identify it. I felt an enormous duty um, with this book in a way almost that I haven't with the previous one. If you think about the previous books, um, with the exception I mean, you know, that somebody was killed on the Vulcan 607 raid. Um, obviously, people were killed in, in, in um, Harrier 809. But I'm largely talking about a military fighting a military. Um, and in some cases, uh, it, you know, in one case, it's a show of force or it's a space mission. But um, that's quite significantly different to uh, uh, um, a book about a, a raid that ultimately takes place in the center of capital city. And, you know, there, Embry... And Sismore, their first reaction to being uh, begged to carry out this raid by the Danish resistance was that, you know, we're going to kill 300 people. You know, this this is we, we, we can't risk this. But the Danes said, you know, unless you do great, many more people are going to be killed because of the resistance is gone. Um, Denmark now until the end of the war, but also Denmark's future after the war um, is destroyed. Um I mean, they, they didn't embrace the prospect of, of flying away with any enthusiasm at all. Um, but, you know, those are the hard choices that people like Embry and Sismore and indeed the Danes in Copenhagen, who, after weighing up the pros and cons, um, said fly the raid, had to contend with. You know, these were really, really difficult decisions to which there was no right answer. But when... When it comes to the sort of human story, um, the thing that made the greatest impression on me um, was getting to meet a man called John Holstein uh, in, in Denmark. And John's now in his 80s. Um, he was uh, five years old in 1944, um, and he was on the receiving end of um, bombs from uh, uh, Operation Carthage. Uh, he was dug out of rubble. Um, he was um, taken to a hotel, he was patched up. He had uh, suffered from a fear of flying um, after that, uh, which he subsequently overcame, um, well, quite, quite substantially, in that he went on to enjoy a career um, as a, a, a sport parachutist, glider pilot, and uh, with an engineering company that made harnesses for search and rescue helicopters. Um, so he really understood the... Uh, um, the nature of the thing that uh, these 
incredible uh, air crews were required to do. But as I said, you know, as a boy, uh, uh, he was traumatized by what had, what had happened in, in Copenhagen. But I went to visit some of the sites that were relevant to, uh, to the Copenhagen raid with John, who's sort of incredibly sprightly um, in his 80s and just a really lovely guy. Um, and we, we looked up and down the road where actually one of the mosquitoes, I know you've been trying not to sort of uh, <laughs> chest point, but a mosquito was lost. Um, on, on the Copenhagen raid um, and the tragic consequences of that. And I went went to visit the site with John um, after we'd gone to some of the other places that were relevant to the raid, um, including the, the railway yard where the mosquito that crashed hit a, um, a pylon which led to its, its, its crash. Um, and he looked up and down the road uh, and sort of reflected on what it was uh, these air crews had undertaken on behalf of his country and the sacrifice that he'd made uh, they they had made and he just uh kind of said quietly to himself um that that they were heroes um and um, that was like, more than anything else that was the thing that guided and informed how strongly i felt about trying to get this story right um uh, I think almost more than any of the other ones, I felt a real obligation uh, to those who had died in the air, those who had died on the ground, uh, not just in 1944, but, um, you know, throughout the war um, to, to get their story right. And, uh, you know, I, I, it'd be for readers to judge whether or not I have. To this reader, is it? Hmm. I, I, I thought it was a very difficult thing to balance. And I think you, you, you did it very well especially for what happens on the raid um, yeah. which is tragic but as you said that that, that there's so so many balls in the air for it mm. dear listener read the book it is out today if you're listening to this on on the day of release um give it a plug Roland. what's it called it's a very complicated title <laughs> so, uh, it's called mosquito uh the raf's legendary wooden wonder and its most extraordinary raid uh, and at the, uh, the heart of the book is this uh, unbelievably challenging but crucial raid on the Gestapo headquarters in Denmark. But through the story, I've uh, through the book, I've kind of threaded, I hope, uh, um, an appreciation of the, the mosquito story um, more broadly. Thank you so much. Absolute pleasure, Matt. Thanks so much for asking me along. I cannot thank Roland enough for his time. He was incredibly generous to spend the evening with me the other week. And as we said, today is release day for Mosquito. So this is not the one you would get today. It'll be a lovely hardback like that. So please do look it up. As always, you can get it if you're in the UK from the damncastersbookshop.org. Link in the description below. 10% of that goes to support the pod. We hope to have more from Roland. We'll have to see if he'll come back. But there's lots to talk about. He is fantastic as you've seen and heard so thank you so much to him by the book it really is good because if it wasn't i wouldn't have had him on the show next week we do have the episode that i teased last week which is all about our 101 and that is the fabulous sam Gwynn joining us to discuss his majesty's airship which is all about the this is gonna upset a few people the disastrous r101 now people have been tweeting at me because i'm not a fan of the big airship let's find out more next week and we can discuss it then until then thank you so much for your support as always if you want to join us on patreon become a damn castier there's all kinds of stuff happening over there you get these episodes early with different intros and outros opportunities to ask questions like joe and errol did in today's episode so you can join up from three pounds a month plus a bit of that check the link in the description and you can find out all the details there. Tell your friends as well. Pod's doing well. We've got some exciting news coming up about our sponsor, the fabulous Pima Air and Space Museum out in Tucson, Arizona. They've got a lot going on. We're going to talk about that some more. Watch this space and follow us on all the socials, including Blue Sky now, which I'm liking because it's quiet and not nuts. There we go. Until next time, thank you so much for your support. Please do take care of yourselves. 
The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bow and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcasts and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.